Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth anniversary celebration of Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. I'm David Andelman, and I'm so pleased to serve as your MC. If we haven't already had the pleasure of meeting in person, allow me to take a minute to introduce myself. In many circles, I'm known as an author, most recently of the book, A Red Line in the Sand, a CNN columnist, TV commentator, and editor. I've been a reporter, international correspondent, and bureau chief. I've worked with major news outlets like CNN, The New York Times, CBS News, Forbes, USA Today, and Reuters. But today, I'm here with you as a heart valve disease survivor. In 2014, I was diagnosed with valve disease when my doctor heard an irregular heart murmur when checking my lungs. It turned out I had a bicuspid aortic valve that was ultimately replaced with a bovine tissue valve. Since the surgery, that valve has beat more than 252 million times. So I join many of you here who also have a personal interest in this important heart valve disease awareness work and everything it involves. Today marks five years since the Alliance for Aging Research and their original 21 partners first recognized Heart Valve Awareness Day, a campaign dedicated to educating and raising awareness of heart valve disease. As many as 11 million Americans have heart valve disease, yet three out of four Americans know little to nothing about it. Symptoms can be difficult to detect and are often, all too often, dismissed by patients and even healthcare professionals as a normal part of aging. This makes raising awareness about the disease critical and reinforces just how important it is to have engaged partners and advocates, like many of you joining us today, helping to spread the word about early detection and treatment. Today, we gather on the annual Awareness Day to continue these important educational efforts while also celebrating how much we have all accomplished. Each year, more and more partners, including patient advocacy organizations, nonprofits, professional societies, hospitals, and other medical care facilities and heart centers join the campaign to engage the patient and caregiver communities across the nation in hopes of reducing the number of people who lose their lives to this disease. As a survivor of heart valve disease, I wanna personally thank all of you for everything you do. Today's a celebration of the great work being done by visionary people. So let's get started. Our first award, the Heart Valve Visionary Award, was created to honor and spotlight the impactful work of a leading heart valve disease patient advocate. We're honored to have Mike Masalem, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Edwards Life Sciences, here to present the award. Mike has been at the helm of Edwards since 2000, and under his leadership, the company's fine-tuned its patient-focused innovation strategy and established Edwards' commitment to philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. As it happens, I've known Mike ever since he reached out personally to me after my surgery, even made it possible for me to meet the team that built my very heart valve at their fabulous manufacturing facility in Singapore. Since 2004, the company and its nonprofit arm, Edwards Life Sciences Foundation, have gifted almost $90 million to nonprofit organizations around the world, supporting underserved patients and strengthening communities where its employees live and work. In 2014, Edwards Life Sciences Foundation launched Every Heartbeat Matters, which has impacted more than 1.7 million underserved people and aims to improve the lives of two and a half million additional underserved structural heart and critical care patients by the end of 2025. The Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day campaign began five years ago, thanks to the generous support of the Every Heartbeat Matters program. Mike's personal commitment to helping patients has been a major force, driving Edward's work and expanding Every Heartbeat Matters forward. Please join me in welcoming Mike. We'll introduce to you our special Heart Valve Visionary Awardee recipient, Donette Smith. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Massalam with Edwards Life Sciences, and I am honored to present the Heart Valve Visionary Award to Donette Smith, an outstanding heart valve disease patient advocate, president of the board of Heart Valve Voice US, and someone who we're, we're proud to call a longtime friend. The Heart Valve Visionary Award 
recognizes a leading heart valve disease patient advocate, and that is Donette for sure. Uh, this award honors Donette for her impactful volunteer work guiding national heart patient advocacy organizations in peer-to-peer -peer connection, education, and activism. You'll be interested to know that Donette actually had a 30-year career in civil service as a technical writer with the U.S. Army and Research Development and Engineering Command in Alabama. And earlier, she worked at NASA's Space Flight, Space Flight Center. So too often people just see patients within the context of their condition. And I want you all to know that Donette's dedication and professionalism run deep and wide. So since her retirement, uh, Donette has generously devoted much of her time to the Mended Hearts, a nonprofit organization that's focused on helping patients and their family through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support and education and advocacy. She is the national immediate past president of the board of directors and the founder of the Mended Hearts chapter in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, she visits patients regularly, and she's a member of the Huntsville Hospital Auxiliary. And if that's not enough, uh, she also is the current chair of the board of the Heart Valve Voice U.S. This is a nonprofit that is a patient-led organization that focuses on improving the diagnosis, treatment, and management of heart valve patients by advocating for early detection, meaningful support, and timely access to appropriate treatment for all people affected. Donette has been a strong patient advocate on the local, state, and national level and the reason she does it all is to help educate others about heart disease. And it's become, she's really been part of that heart community her entire life. Donette, thank you for being an inspiration and powerful model to thousands of heart valve disease patients of how to engage in advocacy. It's wonderful to be with you today and to present you with the Heart Valve Visionary Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, this is quite an honor uh, and a surprise as well, but um, I just enjoy working with patients. I enjoy helping them go through this, this time in their lives when, when they think, you know, possibly this is the end. You know, it, it gives me pleasure to give them hope and uh, encourage them that they can go on and, and uh, build a life and, and uh, not, not look back. I mean, it's just really that simple. And it gives me place. I think that's what's kept me going all these years. But this beautiful, beautiful award, I am so proud. And it will be displayed prominently in my house. And I <laughs> promise you that. So thank you so much for this honor and this beautiful award. I appreciate it. Well, we're all proud to uh, to give it to you. Uh, if you don't mind, Donna, I'd love to ask you a few questions regarding your work that you're being recognized for. So if you're okay, uh, I've got a few. So uh, you, I understand that you were born with a bicuspid aortic valve and you've had numerous surgeries and heart procedures. Would you mind telling us your story and uh, why you became a patient advocate? Absolutely. And in fact, my story goes from birth. So, and I'm 73. So, you know, that's a, that's a long, long story, but I won't go that far. Um, I definitely was born with a bicuspid aortic valve. I had uh, aortic stenosis and was just short of breath all the time. But back in the day uh, when there wasn't as much research and knowledge about heart disease and birth defects, um, my parents were told I had asthma. And they treated me for years with asthma. I, you know, I couldn't keep up with my brothers. I lived in a, a pretty busy neighborhood with all boys. And, and uh, so I could out shoot and out ride and out run all of them. And uh, I, I mean, it was, it was hard, but you know, I thought, okay, this is just the way I am, I'll just do it. And finally, um, when I was uh, going to work for NASA, um, they sent me in to get a physical and they then was the first I heard that I had a, um, had a heart murmur. So that scared me to death as an 18 year old. And uh, so they started doing all sorts of, of uh, tests on me there at, at, at NASA, which made me feel like a, 
like a space cadet or something with what they were doing, but they still couldn't, couldn't diagnose me uh, properly. And the years went by and uh, I finally, when the, the echocardiogram became available, uh, I was properly diagnosed and told that I had what I had and that it would eventually have to have surgery. Well, at age 40, uh, that time arrived and um, I went in for surgery. I had, um, I got a, uh, I got a human valve, a homograph, I think is what they call it. Yeah. And um, so I came out of the surgery, um, was doing okay, had to go back in twice for uh, bleeding and clots and that kind of thing. So I had three surgeries in two days mm. and uh, finally got well from that. And I was told that my valve was still leaking. So I um, um, just went on with daily business, um, had two children and, uh, you know, managed that well and uh, just was doing my thing. And all of a sudden um, on Easter Sunday in 1993, um, I felt like I'd been hit in the chest with a hammer and it was mm. so painful. I couldn't breathe. I had an aortic aneurysm. Mm. And uh, so they, they took me in to repair that. Um, I was in surgery for 10 and a half hours mm. and um, I got a, a, um, a mechanical valve, which I didn't want because I didn't want to have to take Coumadin. And you know how that goes. Everybody says that. And, yep. But you know, when it's done, it's kind of hard to say, okay, let's back up and redo it. But um it was, it was quite a time and um, I got over that. And then um, this is not about heart, but shortly about four years after that surgery, I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm. And uh, with, when I, I went through radiation for about seven weeks and I kept asking them, is this going to damage my valve? Is this going to damage my valve? And it's been 11 years now. Um, I started having symptoms and my heart was uh, not working properly. The valve was going bad and, so I was sent because I'd had so many chest openings. They sent me to Vanderbilt and, and I was given a, a, um, an apical aortic shunt. And inside that shunt, it went from the left ventricle into the descending aorta. And uh, so it emptied from uh, uh, into the descending aorta and there's a pig valve in there. And I, everything was good to go, you know, went on and everything. Well, this year, with everything else going on, I started getting short of breath, and I, I would just push it aside. No, well, it turns out I I went to the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack, and and that's what they told me I had, and um, then went back in because I couldn't breathe, and um, finally made my way back to my regular cardiologist, which is what I should have done to start with, and uh, he he said I know exactly what it is that uh, that valve that pig valve in the um, in the shunt had just stopped working. So I was just literally starving for oxygen. I couldn't breathe. And uh, so I went into the hospital. Um, they kept me over at night. Well, a couple of nights, actually. And finally uh, decided that I, I needed uh, a TAVR and uh, did the TAVR. And um, here I am. Good as new. Wow. And it's, it's been incredible. Well, you're a, you're a miracle. And, you know, most people would have gotten frustrated or angry or something, but instead you became an advocate. Um, what, what, what drove you to do that, Donette? Oh, I see so many people and I talk to so many people who are just discouraged and don't understand what's going on. And they might hear what their physician is saying, but they don't understand it and they're too afraid to ask. So, I mean, I saw that happening over and over and over again, and, and I just had to do something. And it just, it helps me to help somebody else. And I, I think that's what I'm going through all this stuff for. I mean, you name the, the heart disease, I've had it, you know, so I can talk about anything. And uh, it's, so, I mean, I, re I ran into a lady at the restaurant last night and, and uh, she was telling me, she says, I have heart disease. I've had a stroke and she was going on and on, but she said, I just don't know what to do. So we wound up talking and she was the waitress. <laughs> so, you know, you just see, never know where see. you're going to find somebody. But, you know, it's so it's so good for you. It just makes my heart feel good. Uh, you know, when you were telling this your life story or you're talking about running circles around the boys when you were growing up, I'm not surprised by that. You know, a lot of people, they just get intimidated when they get diagnosed with something as serious as a heart valve disease. And and instead, you you try and help them get through the intimidation and get empowered to do something. And, and what is that? Is it just the personal touch or how does that work, Jeanette? 
I think it's just something that you have the right and you can. It's okay for you to ask questions of your doctor. My mother never would. I mean, he was mm. sitting on a throne and you didn't dare question your doctor. <laughs> And she almost let him kill her until I came in and, and uh, says, oh, no, 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 no. You're having a heart attack. You're, you're going to get a stent. And uh, she did. And, and she lived quite a few more years after that. Good, yeah. uh, good years. So, yeah, it's, it's I think a lot of times people just want to hear that it's OK, that, you know, I'm, I'm not crazy. This is actually happening to me. And although I don't understand what the doctor is telling me, they'll ask me questions that they won't ask the doctor. Of yeah. course, I, you know, I, then I steer them back to their physician. It's okay to talk to them. It's okay to ask questions. And, and that seems to, to empower them to, to uh, answer their questions and get what they need. And um, I think everybody's looking for that. I mean, just, just since, you know, I, I, I mean, just since everything that's happened this year, there's a lot I don't know. And I'm, I'm having to ask questions and, and yeah. I have to tell myself, it's okay, you know. So that's well, that's I, why just, I did it. Well, just listening to you, you know quite a lot. Matter of fact, I can't think of many people that have experienced everything that's happened uh, in the treatment of heart valve disease over all these years. And you've had a chance to see the advancement and the changes that have occurred, whether it's over forty years or last even the last ten years. So um, they've obviously changed. What, what advice do you have for new patients when they start considering options or maybe new options? Stand firm. If you've done research and, and do the right research, you know, just don't go to the internet and, and uh, just willy nilly pick something and believe that site's real. I've learned that. And uh, to, to go to a site that's reputable and that will give you the correct answers and and be prepared when you go into the doctor. If you decided you wanted a TAVR and uh, they tell you you can't have one, well, then find out why not. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just that simple. And for them to know that they can do that, it's, I, they're just looking for somebody to tell them it's okay. It really yeah. is. They're afraid and, and they don't want to make the wrong choices. And so I try to, to get them to work with their physician. Probably you, like few others, you've personally experienced uh, so many of these procedures and personally experience talking to patients and supporting them when they're going through their really trying times. And it has to be, you know, deeply personal for these patients in their journey and, and they don't know what to do. Uh, so uh, for the people that are listening, uh, what, what would you like to share about the value of the support that we get for, from others when we're going through those kind of tough times? Oh my goodness, it's priceless. Absolutely priceless. I, I, I remember when, what got me so interested in helping other people and got me involved with Mended Hearts 30 years ago. Um, I was in that room just like these patients that I go visit or when COVID's not around, we could go visit. But, um, you know, it's just being in that room, knowing that you're going in and I mean, they're messing with your heart, you know? I mean, you know, if they're going to cut off a, hangnail that's one thing or you know something like that but they're, they're messing with your engine you know and and that's that's something serious and it's really it really takes you to your knees and uh you have to relook at life and what you want out of it and where i am now and where i want to go and and i think it's so important to have somebody to be there for you i do it all the time even through this i get phone calls from people who just they just want to talk and even in the hospital bedside visits that we do, um, the patient just wants to talk. And, and I've had nurses call me in. They won't say anything. You know, they won't talk to us. Well, I go in and talk to them and, and uh, you know, and they, they feel more comfortable. And I said, it's OK. Talk to your nurses and just having that support behind them. And just and, and honestly, the, the kicker is you walk in their room or you talk to them on the phone and you're upbeat and you're happy and you're living your life to the fullest. And, you know, I've, I've had all these things and I'm still here and still going strong. I don't let anything stop me. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible to share that with somebody else. And they see that in you and they see that you're strong and that you got through all this and they can too. Donette, those are real words of wisdom. 
thank you so much for the unselfish commitment of your time and the, just the extraordinary work that you do to help patients. And congratulations to you on this much deserved award. Thank you. I love it. I really do. Thank you so much. Let's give Donette a round of applause. Great strides have been made in recent years to improve detection and treatment options for those with heart valve disease. Mm -hmm. However, despite these advancements, underserved and minority patient populations aren't receiving adequate attention and as a result are facing uncertain outcomes. You may know that African-Americans are more likely to have risk factors for valve disease, such as high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes. But you may not realize that African-Americans also experience alarming differences in proper diagnosis, treatment, and overall care for heart valve disease. There are great efforts underway to combat this, and in recognition of that, today, the first ever Valve Disease Day Heart Health Equity Champion Award will be presented. Our presenter is Cassandra McCulloch, Chief Executive Officer for the Association of Black Cardiologists. The ABC is a 46-year-old nonprofit organization dedicated to the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease, including stroke, in communities of color, and is committed to achieving health equity for all through the elimination of disparities. Cassandra has been with the organization since 1996, but rose to CEO in 2014. She herself is an active member of many coalitions, boards, and other groups focused on diversity and disparities in healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Cassandra McCulloch, who will introduce our Heart Health Equity Champion Awardee. Hi everyone, I'm Cassandra McCulloch with the Association of Black Cardiologists, and I am honored to present the Heart Health Equity Champion Award to Dr. Isilma Fergus, Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of Cardiovascular Disparities, and Director of Hypertension and Clinical Lipidology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. The Heart Health Equity Champion Award is given to recognize a healthcare provider who has served as an advocate for heart valve disease equity. This award honors Dr. Fergus for her impactful work educating people at the community level about heart health, including heart valve disease, addressing health equity issues that impact risk factors, detection, access to treatment and outcomes, and encouraging people to ask questions and advocate for their own and loved one's heart health. Dr. Ferguson's inspiring career, deep commitment to minority-focused cardiovascular research and ongoing work with the Association of Black Cardiologists are exceptional. As a previous president of ABC and through her numerous professional endeavors, she has had a great impact on the future careers of aspiring cardiologists. Prior to her current position at Mount Sinai, Dr. Fergus has served as Chief of Cardiology at Harlem Hospital Center for three years. She has authored numerous articles related to heart disease in peer-reviewed journals, including her contribution to cardiovascular disease in ethnic minorities. Her current research and clinical interests involves cardiovascular disparities, hypertension, heart failure, and heart disease in women. She has been an investigator in several clinical trials and founder and director of multiple Healthy Hearts projects, including Harlem Healthy Hearts and Montserrat Healthy Hearts, involving education, demonstration, and screening for chron chronic conditions that lead to heart disease. Dr. Fergus, thank you for being such an important influence on heart health equity issues it's wonderful to be with you today and to present you with the Heart Health Equity Champion Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for such a kind introduction. Um, I feel truly humbled to be here today accepting this wonderful award. It's so gorgeous and beautiful, but you know, it really represents um, 
a thank you for something that I love to do, my work in the community, educating, uh, demonstrating as you talked about with these numerous projects. And it's so needed because when you look at statistics for heart disease in the United States, you continue to see African-Americans and communities of color that continue to experience earlier heart disease, more significant or worse outcomes compared with others. And in here in the United States where there's so many resources, there really should be something that we continue to do about it. And so I'm happy to do that. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the Alliance of the Aging for uh, choosing me to be the recipient. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the work that they continue to do and the Association of Black Cardiologists um, the, the ABC has really formulated who I am. And based on my earliest um, memories of being in the ABC, I always um, recognize that the ABC um, continues through its mission, vision, and goals to reach out to uh, underserved communities to ensure that heart health is premier, being you know, presented to uh, the communities in terms of improving their education and outcomes. So I was influenced at a very early age uh, from, with the ABC. And as it relates to heart disease, um, a lot of people are still not aware and don't know the outcomes or don't even know that heart disease is 80% preventable. But when it comes to heart valve disease, even less people know about what heart valve disease is about. And that's really uh, something terrible and something that we have to change because more than 25,000 people a year are likely to die from heart valve disease. So once again, thank you for my wonderful award. I accept it with pleasure and with humility. Thank you. I would like to ask you a few questions regarding the work you are being recognized for. First, for our audience, please define health disparities, and health equity. Do you think that these concepts are sometimes misunderstood? Certainly, I'd be happy to do so. And, and that's a great question because um, these uh, terms get thrown around all the time and there can be some misconceptions. <laughs> so first, let me start with the, dispar the uh, health disparity definition. A health disparity is a difference in health status healthcare access, quality and utilization that occurs based on social racism, ethnicity, gender, education, income, geographic location or disability. And a health disparity is a fundamentally unfair in terms of policy, design and practice. And I look at it as uh, the thing that we need to fix. Whereas equity on the other hand, is the thing that is helping to fix the disparity. But I think the confusion sometimes uh, happens between equity and equality. Equity and equality are not the same things. Um, when you think of equality in terms of what's being provided, let's use an analogy. Think of um, three boys trying to look over a fence at a game, let's say a baseball game. And we have a very tall boy a medium sized boy and a very short boy. They're all given one box the same height um, so that they could look over the fence. And the tall boy doesn't need it because he can see over the fence. Um, the medium boy, it helps him to just be able to see over the fence, but the little tiny boy still is unable to see over the fence with the one box. So they were all given three boxes. Equity on the other hand would mean that in order for all three to see over the fence, the little one is given two boxes. And so now with the two boxes, he is on the same level, eye level with the, all three boys who can now look over the fence and look at um, the game together. So that's the difference between equality and equity. And as I mentioned, equity is a solution to healthcare disparities which occur. And an example, um, another example would be uh, Cassandra, when we think of the social determinants of health, um, which really has to do with where one lives, their access, who they are, and we talked about race and culture, et cetera, what are the solutions? Um, 
uh, in order to solve these issues. And um, one major one, of course, is health literacy. And, um, and that's particularly challenging in, um, in our healthcare because let me just give you an example, almost 48% of patients with hypertension or diabetes had inadequate health literacy. So simply um, improving health li literacy is an equitable solution to reducing the disparities that occur with some of these cardiometabolic risk factors and certainly with heart disease. Thank you. We know that black adults experience risk factors for heart valve disease, such as high blood pressure and heart failure at an earlier age than whites. Please tell us more about that and, and what it translates in detection of heart disease or heart valve disease among black people. Yes, um, you are absolutely right that, um, you know, heart disease may be present earlier in blacks compared with whites. Um, in fact, when you look at certain risk factors such as hypertension, which I like to quote because it's a low hanging fruit that we can fix. And um, so many um, people here in the United States are affected with hypertension and don't even know it because it's a silent killer. But um, black men and women are more likely to have high blood pressure, for instance, at an earlier age in fact, uh, more than one in two um, black men and women who are adults have high blood pressure. And high blood pressure, as you know, can lead to heart failure. Heart failure um, could result in an enlarged or dilated heart, which then leads to a type of heart valve disease. While we know that blacks tend to be younger when they develop heart valve disease risk factors, Less is known about whether healthcare providers are detecting and treating heart valve disease in these patients. One study found um, that the odds of being referred to a cardiothoracic surgeon for treatment of heart valve disease were 54% lower in black patients compared with whites. African-Americans with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis a common type of heart valve disease, also received less surgical and transcatheter valve replacements than would be expected. While blacks represent 13% of the US population and 11% of Medicare population, only three to 4% of TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement patients and 4.8% of surgical patients are black. Um, what are your thoughts on how to address the significant disparities in referral and access to interventions? Yeah, thank you. That, that is just such an important fact. So just to restate that, blacks make up about 13% of the US population when you look at demographics and three to 4% of TAVRs. That is certainly a stark disparity. We were talking about disparities earlier. And so um, this is a multifactorial issue to deal with. So um, referrals, when they do happen, um, happen um, late and there are not many referrals and there are multiple reasons for this. When it comes to general patients in general, they have to be referred in by uh, primary care providers who some of have actually heard them say that um, they're loath to refer some of their patients into some of these medical centers because they don't come back. So they're looking at it in, in terms of um, being able to maintain their practice, which is of course their livelihood. And now there's also patient-based um, you know, reasons why um, early referrals don't happen. Um, so there may be some trust factors within certain communities um, that you know warrants people not going in to be seen earlier or sub letting themselves be referred. Um, there's also um, lack of education, so they don't really know what they don't know. And you know, only um, three out of four people who ended up having a valve disease, valve issue even knew about it. Um, some of the valve conditions, so to speak, may be asymptomatic for a while, and um, they're not picked up unless people are having regular visits and someone actually listens to your chest and hear a heart murmur. 
So what closing message do you have for researchers, clinicians, and patients on heart valve disease and health equity? So that's a broad question, but it relates to what I was just talking about before. So if we could um, talk about uh, each one of them separately, let's talk about the researchers. Um, so first of all, we talked about what the um, what demographics look like here in the United States, 11% uh, Blacks. Unfortunately, many times um, in doing research and in the clinical trials, we don't have adequate representation um, of uh, Black and Brown patients in these clinical trials. So I think uh, researchers have to make a conscious effort to ensure that there's diversity and inclusion in terms of clinical trials so that when recommendations and guidelines are being created, we know that we have had you know, adequate um, inclusion to really say that this treatment or this device or this mechanism actually works for this group. So um, that's important to recognize. And I just talked about um, the clinicians. Um, we have to ensure that um, clinicians actually um, are educated and that they care. I'm talking about the uh, primary care physicians in the community. But I submit to you that um, physicians and uh, clinicians, even in an academic center, um, learning has to be had. And uh, some of this learning has to do with understanding um, one's ethnicity and culture um, to reduce prejudices and stereotyping based on prior expectations. And as we talked about in terms of equity, ensure that these patients so oftentimes have more uh, cardiometabolic risk factors and have other issues like social determinants that need to be addressed, that actually more time um, and not less time would be spent with these patients, educating them about what they need to do so that they can manage their health together. And then as far as the patients, of course, there are a lot of um, you know, patient barriers. Uh, we talked about some of them before, like trust and literacy, um, but you know, ensuring that um, you know, there's information and education within the communities at a level that people are interested in. Meeting them where they're at, at their local community centers, churches, um, you know, continuing with some of the programs, for instance, that the Alliance and the ABC have engaged in. I know that, you know, last year we had an event at the Harlem State Office building uh, where community uh, members came out and really enjoyed. And that was a joint event between the ABC and the Alliance. And we got to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, uh, answer questions, um, you know, show them and read with them literature, you know, pieces of literature or brochures. So, um, you know, continuing um, activities such as that, such as this one would be helpful. So again, I think you have to take each one separately and address each one, um, the researchers, the clinicians and the patients in order to reduce barriers and to um, you know, engage in um, adequate and helpful strategies that will you know, help to reduce the disparities that continue as it relates to heart valve disease in America. Thank you. Dr. Fergus, thank you so much for your time and extraordinary work. And congratulations to you on this much deserved honor. Thank you. It's absolutely been my pleasure to be here with you today. Again, thanks for uh, this award, which I receive humbly. And, um, you know, I just, I just like to do the work that I do, and I hope to continue to do so. Thank you very much. Let's give Dr. Fergus a round of applause. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Each and every one of you plays an integral role in spreading the word about early detection and treatment through the annual Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. The partnerships that continue to grow and strengthen make all the difference. Our next award celebrates Awareness Day partners who have gone above and beyond in their efforts to educate about the importance of heart valve disease risk factors, detection, and access to appropriate interventions. Here to present the award is Lindsay Clark. Lindsay is the Vice President of Health Education and Advocacy at the Alliance for Aging Research, where she's worked for more than 15 years. 
Lindsay creates and oversees the Alliance's award-winning educational and advocacy initiatives, helping ensure they truly educate and empower patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals about diseases and conditions that disproportionately impact older Americans, like myself. She's also been the guide and spirit behind the Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day program since its beginning five years ago. Let's welcome Lindsay to present the Partner with Heart Award. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Clark with the Alliance for Aging Research and I'm honored to present the Partner with Heart Award to Andrea Baer, Executive Director of the Mended Hearts Inc. The Partner with Heart Award is given to recognize a Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day partner who has shown exceptional dedication to spreading the word about the importance of heart valve disease risk factors, detection, and access to appropriate interventions. This award honors the Mended Hearts for going above and beyond in their outreach and impact since the first Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day five years ago today. If you have ever had a loved one with a heart condition who had to be in the hospital, you've probably heard of Mended Hearts. They're the largest peer-to-peer -peer heart patient support network in the world, offering hope and support to patients and their family caregivers for 70 years this year, and providing more than 200,000 visits annually. Mended Hearts and their sister organization, Mended Little Hearts, have over 200 chapters in North America, which serve more than 300 hospitals. Andrea Baer has been a part of the Mended Hearts organization for 12 years when she founded Mended Little Hearts of Southwestern Pennsylvania, shortly after her son was born with a congenital heart defect in 2009. Andrea held a variety of roles, including Director of Patient Advocacy and Vice President of Mended Little Hearts, before becoming Executive Director of Mended Hearts in 2019. Andrea has been deeply involved in patient engagement efforts since she started, working to assure that their voice is at the table and empowering them to become better healthcare consumers and improve their quality of life through support, education, and advocacy. Perhaps most important, she's a proud mom to four children and grandmother to one, who thankfully all live close by to her and her husband in Pittsburgh. Andrea, thanks to you and your colleagues at the Mended Hearts for being such an enthusiastic and impactful voice for heart valve disease awareness. It's wonderful to be with you today and to present you with the Partner with Heart Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Well, fabulous. I want to ask you a few questions about your work at Mended Hearts that you're being recognized for. So let's get started. Okay. Over the past five years, both the National Mended Hearts Organization, as well as many of your chapters, have led Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day events. Would you share some of your favorite activities and tell us how you think awareness efforts can ultimately impact health outcomes? Yeah. So over the past five years, we have had some great events. And every year, I think that they're better than the year before. Um, now, last year, we were excited to be able to have some in-person events and um, where we had photo booths where everybody took their pictures of um, the fact that they knew about valve disease and they were raising valve awareness. Uh, we also have had um, health fairs where on valve disease day, we have chapters who have been able to set up tables and, and booths at their hospital to um, be able to educate everyone who comes into the hospital. But this year, obviously we aren't in person but that doesn't mean we don't have amazing things planned. So we're excited. And we are excited to see what you do this year as well. I know heart disease is also personal for you. You've been open and speaking about your third child, Trenton, and his experience being born with a congenital heart defect. Please tell us his story and your family's story and what you want families to know, no matter what stage of life they're in, about the value of peer-to-peer -peer connection. Yeah, so my son was born on St. Patrick's Day in 2009. Um, we did not know that there was anything wrong prior to him being born. So I think while everybody else was drinking green beer and pre pretending to be Irish, I was um, becoming a heart mom. Um, it was very scary, very dark and lonely place to be. Um, I spent a lot of days really not understanding or knowing what I was going to do next. And I can remember very clearly that my husband's birthday was in July of that year. And I refused to make a birthday party arrangement because all I could think in my head was, I can't imagine if my son doesn't live, how I'm going to have a birthday party. And that's all I could think about. So I didn't see the end of the tunnel and I could not find my way out of that darkness. Um, I had someone reach out to me who said those amazing words that were, I know where you feel and I've been where you are. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you. And it really was a lifeline to me as a mom. Um, she showed me that there was another side 
and that this journey wasn't the end. Um, and so that, in my opinion, is really what Mended Hearts is all about, regardless of what age you come um, to the heart world, you can find that support and find someone to say, I know how you feel and I've been where you are. Uh, and I think that's what makes us really amazing and special. I think you're right. I think it's, a, it's so powerful to be able to talk to someone else who knows what you're going through. To that point, you've done a lot in response to COVID-19 as well. So Mended Heart started Visit Me, a virtual peer-to-peer -peer support and education program that allows people to connect via telephone, chat, text, and video from anywhere in the nation. I saw that you offer a discussion community specific to various heart diseases, including valve disease. Tell us a little more about it and how people can reach out and connect. Yeah, so 2020 was obviously a very amazing year for a lot of different reasons. Here at Mended Hearts, we were able to uh, reimagine what visiting and support looks like um, and take it all virtual, even our peer-to-peer -peer support visits, which were typically done in hospital by the bedside. Um, we do about 200,000 patient visits every year. So it was really important for us to make sure that we were able to still connect with patients while they were um, hospitalized and in quarantine and isolation. So we developed the Visit Me program and we have been able to distribute 500 iPads into different hospitals and community centers across the nation. Um, and we you know, do have plans on expanding that but this technology allows us to have patients reach out to us via video or text, telephone, however they feel like connecting um, virtually and have a peer supporter to talk to. Um, we have a heart line, which is a phone number where people can call and get connected right away um, to an accredited peer supporter. Uh, we have people on staff that are volunteers from um, 10 a.m. till 6 p.m., Monday through Saturday. And um, all they have to do is call the hotline and they get somebody to talk to, which I think was really amazing. I also think that those resources will be used long beyond COVID-19. So it's great that you were able to pivot and get those resources to patients, but I think we'll use them for years to come. Yeah, absolutely. And we're already finding that you know, it will help in decreasing the disparities where we don't have the ability to be in a hospital. Maybe it's a rural hospital. Uh, we don't have chapters there. We don't have members um, that will be able to connect with people regardless of where their geographic location is. Absolutely. Can you tell us what have you learned from your work and your family's experiences about heart health and how do you personally practice heart health? Well, I loved this question because up until about six months ago, I would have lied if I said that I was concerned about my own heart health. You know, I was a busy mom of four kids and an executive director of an organization. And really my own personal health and personal care was um, kind of at the bottom of the list. Um, but I decided last year during quarantine that um, I needed to really make a change because I needed to walk the walk and talk the talk, so to speak. Um, so I started making sure that I was eating right, um, making sure it was a heart healthy diet, was getting exercise, drinking my water. Um, uh, and I've, I'm down 40 pounds now since June and I am actually walking eight to 10 miles at a time, which was like unheard of six months ago. So, um, I think it's really important, but I also think it's really important to stay in care and um, Minted Hearts has a stay in care series going on right now because we're finding that people during, especially during COVID are not seeking care at their doctors. Um, and especially that proactive care and um, that preventative care that they need to make sure that their heart is healthy um, is sometimes being skipped this year um, because people are afraid to go to the doctor or they don't wanna bother the doctor. So we have been doing the stay in care series and lots of webinars and education on, you know, taking care of your heart the whole entire year, regardless of the circumstances. Um, I've been to the doctor and I'm making sure that I get my cholesterol levels checked and um, had a stress test, which the doctor said was a okay. So I encourage everyone to keep themselves in care. I think it's admirable that you're encouraging people to get care and reminding people that this is important and but also remembering that as mothers we often neglect our own heart health and health in general 
And so we need to uh, take care of ourselves as well as our loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for your time and your incredible work. And congratulations to Mended Hearts on this much deserved award. We're grateful for your partnership. Thank you so very much. We are honored and um, grateful as well. Thank you. Congratulations, Andrea, and another round of applause. The goal of the annual Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day is to increase recognition of the specific risks and symptoms of heart valve disease, improve detection and treatment, and ultimately save lives. Besides the collaborative work of our partners, this requires innovation and a commitment to raising awareness about changes in clinical options as they become available. While heart valve disease can be disabling and deadly, innovation in diagnostics and treatments can save lives. Our next and final award, the Heart Valve Innovation Awareness Award, highlights an innovative leader in the fight against valve disease. Here to present the award is Neil Moat, Divisional Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer of the Structural Heart Business at Abbott. Neil has more than 30 years of experience as a medical practitioner, surgeon, and thought leader in the cardiovascular field. Previously a consultant, cardiac surgeon, and director of surgery at the prestigious Royal Brompton Hospital, RBH, in the United Kingdom, Neil's many achievements in the field of structural heart include co-founding the Transcatheter Aortic Valve Impl Implantation TAVR program at RBH in 2007, and playing a major role in the development and evaluation of TAVR nationally and internationally. He also established and led the RBH Transcatheter Mitral Intervention Program, which is the largest in the UK. Neil is a recognized thought leader in the fast emerging field of transcatheter mitral valve replacement and has been closely involved in the early development of some of Abbott's first of their kind technologies. We're grateful for Abbott's partnership and generous support of this year's Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day campaign. Please join me in welcoming Neil, who is clearly himself a leader of innovation, who will present the Heart Valve Innovation Awareness Award Hello everyone, uh, I'm Neil Modes and I have the privilege to be the Chief Medical Officer for Abbott's Structural Heart Business. The Heart Valve Innovation Awareness Award recognizes a physician advocate for heart valve disease innovation and awareness. Both of these areas are of the utmost importance to us at Abbott and I am honored to have been asked to present the Heart Valve Innovation Awareness Award, Dr. Vino Turani. Dr. Tirani is an outstanding heart surgeon who currently serves as the Bernie Marcus Chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery at Piedmont Healthcare and the Marcus Heart Valve Center of the Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta. This award honors Dr. Tirani's dedication to patient-centered care and his recognition of the importance of heart valve disease awareness, as well as his support for educating patients about treatment options that may be available or appropriate well then, Dr. Tirani has a distinguished resume in leadership roles. <laughs> There's so many, it would take too long to go through them all. But in addition to his roles at Piedmont, he is also the current president of the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association, president of the Heart Valve Society, and the president of the South Atlantic Cardiovascular Society. He serves on many professional society boards and is co-chair of the STS ACC National Transcatheter Valve Therapies TVT database, which is a collaboration between the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the American College of Cardiology that monitors patient safety and real world outcomes related to transcatheter valve replacement and repair procedures. He's authored over 550 peer reviewed articles and is principal investigator or on the steering committee for more than 10 valve trials in the US. Uh, Vino, Dr. Tarani, thank you very much for your leadership in clinical development in heart valve surgery and intervention and in, and in cardiology, and for being a dedicated advocate for patients with heart valve disease, working to make sure they are informed and empowered in shared decision-making with their clinicians. Uh, we know each other very well, and it's wonderful to be with you today and to be able to present you with the Heart Valve Innovation Awareness Reward. Very many congratulations. Neil, thank you so much. Uh, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm really deserving of, of the comments that you just made, but thank you so much. I'm uh, humbled and I'm honored. And um, here at the Piedmont Heart Institute, uh, 
uh, this is something that is very special to us that you guys uh, have uh, have uh, chosen us to be a part of this. So uh, truly humbled. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's a, quite an honor for us. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And I think you're going to present yourself with your award. Yeah, this is, uh, I feel like we're at the Oscars or something, right? So uh, this is absolutely amazing. And uh, I just really want to thank the Alliance of Aging Research for, for sending this and, uh, and all the work that they're doing in really uh, promoting uh, valve care in the United States. I think it's something that's so critically important. And the Health uh, uh, Valve Awareness Day is something that I've been a part of with I remember when Lindsay Clark first reached out to me and I thought it was an absolutely phenomenal idea. And I can't wait because we're going to celebrate it here at Piedmont and, and uh, hopefully all over the country. Excellent. And you've been involved with the um, Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day since its um, inception in 2017. What, what, makes, what makes this organization and this day so important to you? So, I mean, I think that right now, when we look at uh, disease therapies for cardiac, I think where we've made the biggest impact, Neil, and you've been in the forefront of this yourself, uh, has been in uh, valve disease. Uh, last year in the uh, TBT database, there were 75,000 TAVRs done and um, in over 30, 40,000 aortic valve, uh, surgical aortic valve surgery done. So we have, over the last decade, we have really provided phenomenal care in valve disease We've expanded the patient population that can receive care. So I think the Valve uh, Awareness Day has really, to me, has is, is culminated the work of almost 15 years of this therapy, how we've developed it. And that's great because I think there are a lot of patients who are still not getting the care that they should be, um, and especially in smaller communities. Um, and I think this is hopefully going to really be a, a culture change uh, and I really think the Alliance of Aging Research is, takes a lot of credit for doing this. I'm so proud to be a part of it. I completely agree. It's a very, um, very important work. Um, you've touched on this a little bit, but um, what do you think have been the most important developments in uh, the treatment of heart valve disease during your career? So I started uh, doing TAVRs in 2006. So it's been a while now. Uh, I think we're the fourth or fifth site in the United States that did them as part of the partner studies by Edwards Life Sciences that originally started the trials in the U.S. I would say that the most impactful has been that um, surgeons and cardiologists now are working together to, to manage the disease process. Before, a surgeon would get the consultation like you and I would have, and then that would be the end of it, and there would be no uh, further advancement. It was either balloon valvuloplasty or it was, for aortic stenosis anyway, it was just one therapy, surgical valve, uh, replacement. I think now uh, what's been the most impactful, and I think quite honestly, the, the benefactors, the benefactors of all this have been patients because now we have multiple therapies and we have uh, pay, uh, surgeons and cardiologists working side by side, hand in hand in the, uh, in the cath lab or the operating room, in the clinic together and making the best decision. I, I really think at the end of the day, the patients win and if we, if we as, a, as a hospital group or system aren't doing that, then we're giving a disservice to the patient. And that's where everything should really be centered towards. I, I completely agree. And I, I think the evolution or development of, of, of TAVA, transcatheter aortic valve replacement and transcatheter mitral valve repair with the, um, with the mitral clip, the, the most important thing is more patients are being treated. It's yes. It's, it's allowed uh, access to treatment for a, for a much larger uh, group of patients. So absolutely. So here we have Jim Cowden, Morris Brown, and myself, the three of us as surgeons, and we're standing right next to Pradeep Yadav and Vivek Rajakopal uh, in cardiology, and we're seeing patients at the same time. And it's absolutely a phenomenal team. And then what I didn't bring up a little bit is that we have a lot of ancillary services around us who are critically just as important, valve APPs, valve uh, coordinators, the imagers uh, here, we are led by uh, uh, Venkat Palsani, who's the head of imaging here at Piedmont, but we're working side by side every day. I didn't do that. I was a resident uh, with, uh, with our colleagues. I think that's the most impactful thing. And at the end of the day, again, patients benefit. Yeah. You really just described this multidisciplinary team at, at sometimes in our world called a heart team. That's right. And alluded to some of the, the, the importance of Maybe you could just summarize, well, why is it so important that all of those people come together? 
um, for the patient. Yeah, I think it's critically important. And, you know, Amy Simone is our director of the, of the Marcus Valve Center that we have here. So I'm living through it. And what we're able to do is, is um, have uh, APPs, uh, surgeons, cardiologists, invasive, non-invasive. We have Miriam, Kim who, uh, Miriam uh, King, who runs our uh, surgical clinic, and they all are talking to each other, and they're all working together, and that becomes a absolutely seamless process. To me, that's really what the epitome of a valve team is. It's not the surgeon and the cardiologist who get a lot of the credit. It's the support team around us that are able to make uh, all the magic happen. I completely agree. And um, we've, we've obviously made great progress. Um, physicians, I think, working in collaboration with, with industry and, and innovation. Right. But there's, there's, a way to, there's a way to go. Um, what, do you, what do you think are the key unanswered or unmet needs that, that necessitate further research or innovation? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question, Neil. I, I think the mitral valve uh, regurgitation is wide open. You know about this uh, a lot more than I do. And I think that, that to me, that's really the epitome. Uh, that's one of the disease processes that I think is going to become even more and more important. Right? As you know, the only uh, available device transcatheter, in addition to surgical, is uh, the edge-to-edge -edge repair, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. And that uh, uh, is our only option. But I think that over the next five years, we're going to see which patients are best with that, which patients are best with uh, transcatheter mitral replacement, which patients should have minimally invasive surgery, who should have open surgery. So I think that whole field is wide open. I think we've spent a lot of time on aortic stenosis over the last decade, 12 years, but I think that uh, it'll be the mitral. And don't forget about the tricuspid valve. It'll be the time for mitral and tricuspid to shine over the next five to seven years. And the second thing that does encompass all of valve surgery, I think, will be just the idea of uh, patients who are still out in the community with severe disease who aren't getting to the referral center. So really a, um, a plethora of patients out there who are dying, um, not only because of the COVID pandemic, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, but just even before the COVID pandemic, people weren't coming for therapy. And I think we need to do a better job educating them and getting them involved. So I think those are two large areas that I think that over the next five years, we'll spend a lot of energy on and make some serious impact. I completely agree. Um, Davina, you've just touched on it. We've obviously been living in a pretty strange world for the last uh, nine or 10 months. Yeah. Um, what have the implications of the pandemic been for the, the care and treatment of patients with valvular heart disease? Yeah, I think that, and we've seen this in coronary artery disease also, um, as you know, Neil, a lot of patients um, didn't come for therapy and it's sad. Um, it saddens uh, me, it saddens our institution. Um, I think that a lot of patients are scared to come here for rightful reasons. And I think that there are a lot of patients who are uh, not getting therapy and dying from valve disease specifically in the community. And I, that's been my biggest concern for COVID uh, as far as a care for valve disease patients. I do think we've made some advancements, however. Telemedicine is much more prominent now than it ever has been before. So I think we've made some strides, but COVID has uh, significantly impacted how we manage these patients. I will tell you that some patients have gotten more transcatheter therapy because the hospitals are full. And we're trying to get patients in and out faster than it would be for the five to seven days or four to seven days that the patient would stay for surgical valve uh, therapies. Yeah, and, and you know when when we have disruptive events, there's often some good. Um, we'll, yep. we'll come out of this. And I think, you know, you, you've mentioned telemedicine and remote care, remote monitoring, remote education. I think these are things that are, are likely to be with us forever. I think so. I think they've, they've uh, we hope that we get something good out of this, Neil, right? It's been such a, uh, it's been so, so hard for, uh, especially uh, minorities and other uh, uh, racial disparity issues that we're having with COVID and therapy. And I'm really worried about that we've left some people out um, where we're trying not to, and we need to figure out ways to get them engaged and take care of them so that they can have a, a, a normal life trajectory after they get their valve fixed. Again, again, you touched on this in a couple of your answers, you know, equity of access and, yeah. and, and care. And I think COVID has highlighted uh, some of that. Um, it, it, what, are, what are your thoughts about what we need to do to make access to care more equitable? So this is really important, Neil. Um, 
we just recently are in the process at TBT for the National Registry where Wade Bachelor is uh, helping uh, us, John Carroll and I, uh, uh, lead a project on COVID and disparities uh, for transcatheter valve therapies, specifically TAVR. Uh, and so we actually have submitted that for the ACC for a, a, uh, an abstract. And so we're looking carefully at how, what has, how has COVID affected uh, uh, patients, especially the, uh, for racial disparities and getting newer technology. So I think that's just very important. We want to study this very aggressively. And the other thing that we're looking at also is how do we get uh, minorities to participate in research trials um, and to provide the highest, uh, newest technology uh, to all uh, members of the community, not just a certain elite population. I think that's something that we as trialists, and Neil, we've talked about this in some of the trials that I'm involved with with you, of how we can do that. We need to do a better job with educating at the ground level, not just in the ivory tower level. We, we have to shift the way um, we discuss with patients, and how we approach uh, with patients on, on um, getting them, getting these patients into the, the uh, highest technological and more advanced technological um, therapies that we can. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think I think events like, you know, the heart valve disease awareness day is, is, is key in that as well, that, that, that patient awareness That's of right. valve disease and what can be done, uh, you know, the type of um, therapies uh, that are available is yep. a, a key part of that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that we've just started to realize the power of of, uh, of this valve awareness day, I have to be honest with you. I think we're just seeing, we're at the, we're at the, it's going to continue to escalate very nicely. And, and had it not been for the Alliance of Aging Research, we wouldn't have even done this. So, I, so this is beautiful. This is going to be beautiful over the next five, 10 years. We're going to, we're going to say, wow, look what we started. Yeah. And I just echo, um, you know, your comment about the Alliance for Aging Research. I mean, I think it's, it's so important. And I, I think we are, just starting this journey and, you know, with social media and the ability to get information to, uh, to patients broadly, I think it, it, as you say, it's going to be um, a very, uh, a very positive road um, over the next few years. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that especially as patients start to, to participate in their own care and we make this very patient centered um, outcomes research uh, will become even more important. I think this is just the beginning. So Vino, Dr. Tarani, thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all the extraordinary work that you've done in your, um, in your career. And, and I'm sure there's, there's much more to come. Um, congratulations to you on, uh, on this very well-deserved reward. And it looks like, I, I, I haven't seen it live, but it looks like a very, very nice piece of, <laughs> piece of artwork. So, um, so personally, um, you know, we know each other well, yep. very many congratulations. Uh, you know, Abbott, from all of us in the structural heart community, commend you on your work and uh, your dedication to the field and to patients. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. Again, we're uh, humbled and honored. And quite honestly, I can't wait to see you in person instead of the Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah, it would be good. Thank you <laughs> thank again. You. Thank you, Neil. And congratulations, Dr. Tarani. I'm sure you all agree that we're incredibly fortunate to have such remarkable partners in the fight against heart valve disease. And to that point, please turn your attention to a short video that highlights some of the extraordinary work that you and the Awareness Campaign partners have accomplished over these five years. It's a small sample of the wonderful events, gatherings, educational series, social media campaigns, radio interviews, press releases, and other creative ways our partners have engaged with their audiences to make sure more people know the risk factors and symptoms of valve disease and listen to their hearts, getting care when they need it. But let me take one last opportunity to thank you. It's the commitment of people and organizations like yours that are making a difference. And if you aren't yet engaged in the campaign, we welcome you. Check us out at valvediseaseday.org and everyone, please just tune us in at 3 p.m. Eastern this afternoon for a Twitter chat at Valve Disease Day and at ABC Cardio One. I'm David Andelman. Thank you. Heart valve.
risk factors or symptoms with ease, yeah. We're here to tell you that hope's on the way, that heart valve awareness is today. Listen to your heart, keep your health in your sight. Listen to your heart, if something Thank you to our 92 partners. Your combined expertise and commitment to raising heart valve disease awareness is what makes this day a success. Together, we are striving to increase recognition of risk factors and symptoms, improve detection and access to treatment, and ultimately save lives. Thank you to Edwards Life Sciences Foundation and Abbott for making this campaign possible through your generous support. Most importantly, thank you to all those living with heart valve disease, as well as family caregivers and advocates who have shared your stories with us. You are our inspiration.